Welcome to a very, very special uh, episode of Global Health Talks. I'm sitting here with someone who is in a class by himself. Um, I had the great ple pleasure of meeting Professor Raphael Meshulam. In 2019, I was uh, asked to go to Stanford University to the Steinman Laboratory there, where they were doing some very interesting things. They were working with opioids and having some success transferring people away from opioids uh, through the use of, of uh, CBD. And I thought this was very interesting, although it was really very high above my, my science level. But I went to the lab and I made fast friends with uh, Larry and John. We even went to a basketball game. <clears throat> and the following they, day, they said, uh, we want you to meet members of our team. So I thought, well, maybe we'll drive and have some lunch someplace and meet some people. They said, no, no, no. Tomorrow you go to London, then you go to Oxford and you meet Sir Mark Feldman because we want to show you the work he's doing with pediatric epilepsy. Great, great successes there. So I flew there and I met with Sir Mark and had a splendid time there. And he said, now it's time for you to fly to Tel Aviv where you are going to meet the father of all of this. And I thought, what could that possibly mean? Now, anecdotally, I will tell you, three months prior to this trip, my mother passed away at the grand age of 99 with a splendid, splendid, splendid life. Um, and, but this was, this was right sort of here in my head. So I leave Sir Mark and I fly to Tel Aviv and I get picked up, driven out to the Waldorf Astoria getting, you know, inching my way closer to you. <clears throat> and the night before I'm ready to come in and talk with you and ask you questions, I realize all of those questions are on my flash drive. I need to print them. So I went to the front desk at 3 a.m. There was one young girl there in her 20s. And I said, excuse me, could you do me a favor? Could you come to the business center, open it up for me because it was closed? Could you print me one page? Because I'm, I'm going to do an interview at Hebrew University. And she said, certainly, sir. So she accompanied me to the business center. She popped in the flash drive. She hit print and up comes a page that says questions, Professor Raphael Meshulam. And she's reading this at the exact moment and she breaks into uncontrollable sobbing and crying. And I'm going, oh, and what does a guy do? I mean, I, I grabbed her, I patted her on the back. I said, it's okay, it's okay, whatever it is, it's okay, it's okay. She said, well, no, no, I must tell you. I went to the best hospital in Tel Aviv and six months ago was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And I said, oh my. And she said, well, the reason I'm crying is because when I saw that page come out, the hospital had told me the future of this terrible disease is in the hands of Professor Meshulam at Hebrew University see what you can do to get into his clinical trial. So I said, well, give me your information. Just give me your, your contact information. The car came by, it picked me up, it drove me out to the university. I met you, I cleaned off a little place on the couch to sit down. And the first thing that I said to you before we started was, let me tell you this story of what happened to me. And you were good and kind enough to bring in your lead lab person and they put her into one of your trials. And I haven't had any other contact with her, but I was so impressed with this that when I went home, 
I took a little walk from the Waldorf over to the Western Wall and had my first conversation with my mom at the wall and said, you're not going to believe where I am. You're not going to believe what happened at 3 a.m. last night. You're not going to believe the man that I met today. And I, I said, if this is where the world is going, it's a good world. And it's, it's uh, Rafi, I, I just want to tell you from a personal standpoint, <clears throat> I marvel not only at your intellect, but everything that you're doing. Cannabidiol is a very, very interesting compound. It is a natural product. It is uh, produced by the plant. As a matter of fact, the plant produces something else. The plant produces an acid, but the acid is not stable, and it is converted just by sitting around into cannabidiol. And cannabidiol is a, an extremely interesting compound because it has a lot of effects, essentially all of them positive. It's not toxic. It, uh, nobody has ever uh, died from cannabidiol. It is... Uh, 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 one of the very few compounds I have worked with and I have seen no side effects. And um, the reason is that cannabidiol works on a large number of uh, physiological uh, things that happen with us, all kinds of inflammation, all kinds of uh, uh, diseases that are known as autoimmune diseases. These are diseases that the body for some strange reason attacks itself and so on, but it has no side effects. And um, uh, this particular compound, one yes, one has to use rather large uh, amounts, but it has been shown to be effective in a huge, huge number of disease states. There was a group in Germany that gave it for schizophrenia and it worked very high doses. Now, maybe, just maybe, it will be possible to make derivatives of cannabidiol that one will need lower amounts. But at the moment, we have a, a situation that I've never seen with any other compound, namely, no toxicity, no side effects. Maybe some people say that they uh, they go to sleep better, or, or maybe that's because it contains a little bit of THC. Unfortunately, CBD as such it has not been really introduced as a drug, which is a pity. But I can see that happening in the future. And most probably, we shall have CBD as a compound that... Uh, will be used by uh, millions of patients because of the lack of side effects. Now, CBD was discovered in the 30s by two groups, one in the US, one in the UK, and um, uh, they didn't know the structure. They just kind of knew a little bit about the structure. I was surprised that this was so. So in the 60s, when I started work on cannabinoids, the first thing I did was re-isolate CBD from hashish, and there is quite a lot of it there, and elucidated structure, because you see scientists are kind of strange individuals. Pharmacologists don't want to work on something they don't know, the structure. So we elucidated the structure, and we started preparing large amount of CBD and we saw, as I said, no toxicity, no side effect. So we started some clinical trials and we went ahead and um, uh, gave uh, CBD to different kinds of patients, but um, we gave it for epilepsy, for example. And I mentioned epilepsy because Today, it's proof for epilepsy. We did a clinical trial with my friends and colleagues in South America. 
maker. And yes, it was an excellent compound. And so I thought, well, we published that. We wrote, here we have patients. We took patients that got CBD. We had patients that didn't get CBD. And nobody knew who was getting uh, CBD and who was not getting CBD. And these patients that had epilepsy and nothing else was helping them, cannabidiol helped out of a small number of patients. We had about 15, about seven or eight got uh, just a placebo, namely nothing. Um, and uh, the rest got CBD, uh, 200, 300 milligrams. And out of seven patients, four had essentially no, no attacks. Previously, they had several attacks a day. Uh, three had mm, a less and less and less attacks. Only one was not affected. So we published that, 1980. Well, I thought, here is something that can help. For 35 years, nothing happened. I, I don't know. I, I really didn't know what to do. Then it turned out that uh, families, uh, parents had l learned about the effect of CBD and started moving in the States to one of the states that uh, cannabis was available. And they started uh, treating themselves, their children with uh, cannabidiol. Well, it turned out that it was working. So a British company went ahead and did a big trial and several hundred patients. And yes, they saw exactly what we had seen 35 years previously. And they uh, and NH uh, or, or the government, the US government uh, had no problem. It approved it. So today, CBD is anti epileptic drug working very well with a huge number of patients. Now, why couldn't we do that 35 years earlier? We could have helped thousands of patients. Yes. The same is true for several, several other disease states. We lack clinical trials. I'm not a clinician. I'm a chemist, a biochemist, I'm working with compounds, working on their structure, their effects, their synthesis, and so on. I'm not, I cannot do a clinical trial. I don't have the clinical background. But clinical trials are essential in order to uh, introduce a compound as a drug. And clinical trials are not there. Uh, why? I don't know. As I mentioned, schizophrenia, terrible. And yet, there are no major clinical trials. I don't know of a company that's going ahead with cannabidiol trying to uh, help with schizophrenia. 1% of, of the population everywhere. It's not uh, just in the US or in the UK. 1% of the population has schizophrenia. We can help. Cannabidiol can be used. And um, there are also a long, there is also a long list of disease states that it has been shown in mice, in animals, that it helps. Well, we need the clinical trials. There we stand today. And uh, I, I really think that it should be advanced. Now, I can realize that companies do not want to work to work with cannabidiol because there is no patent and uh, <clears throat> they'll be spending money and not getting everything back or something of that sort. But there are governments, after all, that should try to push forward, uh, maybe together with the company, uh, push forward cannabidiol and uh, see the results. As a matter of fact, it's not only cannabidiol. We have in cannabis, quite a few other compounds that seem to be very promising. Now, THC is the compound that causes the psychoactivity. Right. And as a drug, it's a minor compound. It's, it is used as a drug, but it's a minor compound because of the psychoactivity. I mean, people don't want side effect. And if somebody wants a drug, a side effect, the cannabis side effect is, uh, well, they don't want it. 
but there are other compounds. There is a compound which we isolated, com call it cannabigerol, which is probably uh, parallel to CBD. Of course, we don't know. Uh, I know this because we wrote a book on CBD, which is about to be published by MIT in, uh, in Boston. And I tried to see whether we can have CBD and CBG. And then I realized that, well, there is quite a lot of work on CBD. There isn't that much work on, on CBG and cannabigerol. So we uh, left it aside, but it's a promising compound. There are some, some others. So I believe that we shall have within a decade, maybe 15 years, a lot of use of pure CBD, maybe also pure CBG, maybe a few of the other compounds, and um, in parallel, chances are that people will continue to use medical cannabis. It's so uh, uh, widely used today that I don't see that the medical cannabis will disappear. So chances are uh, that within, I say, decade, we shall have pure CBD as a major drug like most of the drugs that we have today are one drug or maybe two drugs, but well analyzed, specific, and in parallel, we shall still have a medical cannabis, which is a mixture. And this mixture is never the same again, but people will continue to use it. So we shall probably see two ways of using cannabis in the future. Do you have a um, do you have a preference an administration preference between edibles, let's say, and and topical uh, uh, administration into the body? Have you seen any evidence which provides you? I know you don't like vaping, that's for sure, because uh, we had that yeah. conversation once before. But that's obvious. That's obvious. Well, um, vaping is as a, a as a chemist, as a researcher, vaping is a problem for me because I have no idea how much material goes into the body. Now, uh, but that's, some people prefer vaping because the effects are seen within minutes. A uh, patient doesn't want the effect uh, within an hour. Edibles, particularly cannabidiol and so on, the effects are really seen after more than an hour. So one, one should uh, have to decide what to do. But in any case, um, there are several ways of doing it. And the two ways you mentioned, both are okay. And um, a particular patient, maybe he would like one way or the other way. It doesn't matter that much. Now, I, in a global perspective, <clears throat> Are some countries doing a better job than the United States? Well, uh, yes and no. Yes, in Israel, we have more than 100,000 patients that have approval of medical cannabis. Now, medical cannabis here can be obtained in several different forms. Medical cannabis, which has a lot of CBD and a little bit of THC, medical cannabis that has a 50-50, and a medical cannabis that has a lot of THC and a little bit of CBD. And it depends on the physician uh, what kind of uh, material he will get. But there are, as I said, 100,000 patients uh, in a country that has about 8 million population. Now, we don't have that much in the US, much, much less. So in this respect, uh, Israel is uh, different. I wouldn't say better, it's different than the US. But if one looks at the UK, for example, there is essentially no use. Very, very few uh, clinicians uh, recommend uh, cannabis. Very few, although it's possible. Uh, legally, it's possible to do that but they are not aware, they have not studied 
uh, cannabis at school, their their information is uh, limited, if you wish. And so we have a strange situation. That well, the you know, we, we, we realize, Professor, that there are economic barriers. You know, yes, sure. you're, you're certainly not going to get buy-in from the pharma companies uh, without the patent and anything that might be conflictive uh, to, to some other method. Uh, the, the, the fine, fine results achieved with epilepsy, although sadly it took so long for, for you to bring this discovery, you know, to market, <clears throat> um, that was twofold. Not only was, was, the, the, was uh, uh, your system working to dampen uh, seizures in children, but none of the other pharmaceutical drugs were doing very well at all, and children were pretty much immune from anything that could help them. So it was, it was pretty much dire straits. Um, can you bring me up to speed a little bit on multiple sclerosis, sclerosis? And then could we go through a real quick, maybe five to 10 disease states that you're encouraged about? Just take five. Um, uh, that you that you are you're seeing some encouraging signs because we want to get that information out. Also, in our global talk, it goes it extends far outside of Israel. It extends far outside the UK and America. We had Dr. Terry Knapp, one of the collagen founders, <clears throat> founded Collagen Corporation, Stanford Plastic Surgery. Um, he has started something called CareSpan. CareSpan is clinic in the cloud, and he is a very charitable, charitable doctor, spent decades of his life doing cleft palate for free around the world in, in underserved populations. Clinic in the cloud is an attempt via satellite to build the same delivery messaging to patients, the same opportunity in the poorest areas of the globe, to those being received at Cedars in, in Beverly Hills. And the push is on now because we've just been taken through this COVID nightmare. <clears throat> and COVID has, in some ways it's pulled us apart, but in many other ways it's brought us together in that we learned this new world called, word called pandemic that most lay people had never used before. So, with that, with this sort of existing tug and pull that's happening in the world, can you tell us about a few more opportunities other than MS, other than epilepsy, where you're seeing some encouraging signs? Well, one of the major effects of CBD is its effect on anxiety. Most of us are anxious for one reason or another. And we overcome that. But with quite a few patients with a huge number of disease states, there is an anxiety beyond the disease itself. I mean, people say I'm, or people feel I'm sick. I can't do A, B, or C. And I can't uh, work as well. And I, all, all the major problems that are with uh, chronic diseases. CBD most definitely affects anxiety. So this is maybe not, uh, 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 it doesn't cure the disease, but then people feel that they can survive with it. I mean, there are so many problems with many diseases, with essentially every disease. So if one can work on the anxiety without seeing any side effect, that's the major uh, way I see cannabidiol in the future. Now, uh, it also works with inflammation. Now, many, many disease states have inflammation, whether we see it on us or whether it's inflammation of a specific organ. Yes, cannabidiol works on inflammation. So in many disease states, I see that cannabidiol will be administered together with a specific drug in order to reduce inflammation, 
in order to reduce anxiety. Two different things entirely, but they are very, very central. Anxiety on one hand, and in, which is uh, 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 what we feel, and the inflammation, which is really something that happens. So uh, I can see that I can see cannabidiol as not only as a drug by itself, but as a drug that helps additional disease states not directly affecting them. So that means that in most probably in a huge number of disease states, I don't know whether it's 30% or 50%, people will be using cannabidiol in order to help themselves within that uh, situation. Now, we're getting older. A uh, hundred years ago, people uh, used to die by the age of 60 or 70. Today, a huge number of uh, people around are uh, at 80 or 90. Incidentally, I am, guess how old I am? You're going to be 92 if you're not already. Yes, I'm 91 plus. And uh, so you can uh, say you're, you're 91 and a half, as okay. children say. I'm 91 and a half. Exactly. And um, I still manage to work because the conditions are such that I took good care of myself and I can work and I have a good lab and so on. But there are all kinds of disease states that come, uh, come along. And in one case, I found that cannabidiol really helped with anxiety, with inflammation and so on. So I'm not speaking of a specific disease, mm -hmm. although we know that it helps with multiple sclerosis, it helps with Parkinson's, uh, presumably it helps with schizophrenia, but it also will help as an additional drug to manage all those situations that patients feel in and are not happy with them. So we shall have cannabidiol not as a specific drug, which it will be for certain disease states, but also as a drug that will help people uh, uh, with whatever disease they have or with many of the diseases they have. I want to thank you for, for enlightening us in so many different ways. There are so many people who are, are so anxious to hear you and to take benefit of this lifelong work that, uh, in, and this selfless um, dedication that you have had to doing this. I have many friends who swear by CBD. Allow and me to say something a little bit different. Yes. We, we were speaking of the plant material alone. CBD is a plant material. But yes. our body makes compounds that, are, that act like cannabinoids, like THC, if you wish. And they're extremely central in our physiology. We isolated one of them, an andamide, many years ago, another one, 2-AG. They're very central neurotransmitters, if you wish. And these compounds, although they are so important, made by ourselves, have never been investigated in humans because of legal problems. Uh, unbelievable. That is, that is such a damn shame. And they're not, they're unbelievable. You see, a hundred years ago, insulin was discovered and became a drug um, almost immediately, a very, very good drug. Here we have compounds that were discovered almost 30 years ago that were, that are very central in our uh, physiology, and yet they have not been investigated in humans. I, I can't explain that, 
but there we are. Well, part of it, you know, is owing to the that period of time when these things, um, you know, when CBD was only known as marijuana and it's how you got high. Um, yeah. Mushrooms and, and everything else were all the, the, the sort of the escape modality and a lot of people got injured by them. So they were not yeah. controlled. So there's a lot of roll off effect about that. But that generation is now being replaced by newer generations. And I believe the future of all this splendid work that you and your colleagues, and one of the other great things that we can say about you is you have trained people who will, who will carry this torch. And, um, and you have also learned from the very best. So it's a fraternity of amazing, skilled, scientific minds who are just going to keep growing it and growing it. I'm seeing it happen right now in global acceptance of so many uh, different different procedures that were pretty much only found in in Europe and uh, and America till this time. So I I believe that pharma is on notice. I'm currently I'm developing a show right now with PBS called The Plant Whisperer, and it's Good talking luck. it's talking to Zhao Gulan in Bama, China, about why people live there to 110 and 115 without diabetes, you know, without heart disease, and I think we're coming full circle to the moment in time when people are the light bulb will go off. And people are going to realize it's been right in front of us all the time. And let's get busy. Well, it has to do with collaboration. We, my group, collaborates with a huge number of other groups in pharmacology, physiology, the clinic, and so on. Uh, I believe that any important advance in medicine or areas related to medicine has to be done in collaboration. And I found that this is the way to do it. I collaborate with outstanding scientists in the US, UK, South America, Europe. And I believe that this is the best way to advance a field, certainly in medicine. Thank you, Rafi. It is, um, you know, I we're all hoping and praying in October, we hear some, some Nobel news, but, um, you know, that prize is more deserving of you than you are deserving of it. So we'll leave it at that. And we hope and pray, shalom. And uh, I will come back at you because I am drawing out some things uh, that, that I've heard in your conversation, which may be interesting for you on other fronts, which would have a, a, you know, a less formal conversation. But I, I'd love to discuss it. I'll be delighted to help if I can. <laughs>